If this image were in a museum, no one would doubt its importance to our shared history. But history isn't just the artifacts and institutions. It's also the precious objects we hold in our hands and hearts. The ordinary family photos that people create every day. This is Family Pictures. Family Pictures. Family Pictures USA action. I'm Thomas Allen Harris, filmmaker, photographer, and host of Family Pictures USA. We're traveling the country, inviting everyone to share their family photos, revealing a new history of our community, our country, and ourselves. Once you see America through family pictures, you'll never see this country the same way again. This is Florida's Paradise Coast, from Fort Myers to the Everglades, the southwestern edge of our southernmost state. Finding paradise with dolphins in southwest Florida. Where paradise is fishing, farming, cattle, and community. This is the first three months yeah. in the United States. These images. People with big dreams see endless possibilities. This photo gives me strength. I'm living in one of the most beautiful cities in America, in Naples, Florida. But this beautiful landscape is often overwhelmed by people who adore it and natural forces that devastate it. It's all in the family album. This is my great-grandfather, Bill Brown, who came from England in the late 1800s. My great-grandfather had a trading post with the Seminole Indians at Big Cypress Reservation. And in this picture, my grandfather is with Josie Billy, who was a medicine man for the Seminole Indians. They grew up down in the Everglades together at the boat landing. When my grandfather passed away over at the grave, he spoke in Seminole and did a eulogy for my grandfather. And they were friends for life. And on the bottom is a picture of Brown's boat landing. This was when the Everglades had not been drained by the Army Corps of Engineers. And at that time, the water flowed freely down in the Everglades. For centuries, people were drawn to the Everglades and its hidden waterways. Explorers, outlaws, and Native Americans pushed from their land by the U.S. Army. Here, surrounded by mangroves, they lived off the land and the sea. Leroy Osceola is a Miccosukee artist who lives with his family on land settled by generations of his ancestors who descended from the Seminole Nation. The Everglades is a river, you're saying? Yeah, it, it comes from Lake Okeechobee and goes to the ocean from north to south. There's different rivers, ones you see and ones you can't see. And it's all the lifeline of the earth. Because it's like your blood vein coming from your heart. It's the same. So everything is connected. Four generations of the Osceolas gathered to share photos that they took and old photos taken by white explorers. We ask everyone to wear white gloves to keep the oil off the pictures. So I will pass out white gloves so that we could keep your wonderful family photographs. Do you think that grandmother would wear the white gloves? Can someone ask her? Anybody in Alajing or what? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 I've been <laughs> My uncle would come in. <laughs> she wants to know what you guys are gonna make her touch that she has to wear. <laughs> well, we're gonna make her. We're gonna make her touch the photos. <laughs> is is this is this you? Eh? Do you know? Yep. Yes. Yep. Yes. Do you, Do you remember this day? Mm hmm. Yeah. Spring. That's Fort Myers. Fort Myers. Because they used to work in the fields and travel. I wherever see. there was work. And who took this photograph? She, she said it was white people. <laughs> okay. Could you ask her how things have changed since this picture was taken? 
So it's unrecognizable now. I see. And which is the next oldest photograph we should see? Your Ian Watcher. It's her sister-in-law and her, my father's mother, she said. 1920s. Yeah, earlier. Yeah. earlier. When the younger people look at this image, your father's grandmother, what kinds of things come to your mind? Just overall strength and pride, perseverance, you know, through everything that people have gone through in war and in peace. Mm -hmm. So that's what I see. Because the life was not very easy back then. Not at all. Not at all. That's Osceola from back door. They took that, painted him after they captured him when he was in prison. This, this is an ancestor of yours? Yeah. I'm their fifth generation. Before Florida joined the United States, Leroy's ancestor, a Mikosuke leader named Osceola, fought the U.S. Army in the Seminole Wars. To this day, his descendants call themselves the Unconquered People. They have never signed a peace treaty with the United States. They caught him under the flag of truce, supposed to be a meeting, but they put him in prison. That's when he stabbed the treaty, saying that no white man's gonna tell me where to live or how to live. He said he was a Seminole. Seminole means being native, the way you were made, your beliefs. What does it mean to have the legacy of being unconquered? It's who you are and what your beliefs are. When you're a young boy going out with, you know, your father and your uncles where, to work, it's certain things that, you know, they tell you and teach you and it translates to modern times and how you're supposed to follow in those footsteps as best you can. There's a rich verbal history. It's not anything you'll find in a book anywhere. That's how we teach that to our children. So this chege, this looks like a workspace here. Yeah, this is my wood shop. And I do the large carvings. And the canoe is a very important historic part of our survival. Nobody that does it anymore. I'm the only one that does them. How did you learn? From my uncles, they taught me. We'll just pull it this way slow. Okay. Grab, grab it over here. We're going to put it on its belly. OK. It's not done. It's still, I still have to finish it off. Mm -hmm. Can I get inside this? Yeah, yeah. This size is for like a 10 year olds. I see. They call it a beginner's boat. That's where they learn how to maneuver it and stuff. Leroy is an independent Mikosuke, a traditionalist who lives off the reservation and doesn't take income from Florida's multi billion dollar tribal casino business. We're an endangered species in the way that. We're maintaining our lives and our beliefs the way the Creator wanted us to. There used to be a lot of families, but everybody moved to the Federal Reservation, abandoned their camps. Some families still are living this way, but it's not that much, not like it used to be. What is the difference between the life that your parents and you have established here versus, let's say, on the reservation? Yeah, on the reservation, everyone's divided into their homes. The purpose of a camp, it was to keep the families together because being together is a big part of the culture. Cutting through Leroy's land is the Tamiami Trail, named for the route Tampa to Miami. It connects the west and the east coasts of Florida, inviting tourists to take a trip in hours that once took weeks. In the 1920s, a land developer named Baron Collier used brand new dredging technology, two and a half million sticks of dynamite, and the better part of five years to dredge the Everglades and pave a strip of paradise. It would take an enormous toll. Thomas Lockyer heads the Museum of the Everglades in Everglades City. When the Tamiami Trail was built between 1925 and 1928, they essentially built a, a wall directly down the center of where the Seminole people lived. And the Seminole traveled by boat primarily. This mm -hmm. was their hunting ground. This was their fishing ground. You were used to bringing your canoe through this certain yeah. way to get to these different like areas. Like you see suddenly, right here. Yep. Uh -huh. And suddenly there was what was, in all essences, a wall. 
You think about the, the idea that before Beer and Collier built that road, there were no roads. The way that people got here was by boat. Um, all over this all, area. Yeah, all, all the travel was by boat. The original settlers came here by boat. Baron Collier, when he first came here, looked around and said, I'll take it, came here by boat. Damming the Everglades would upend the ecosystem, harm the wildlife, and threaten Seminole culture. As tourists arrive, Seminole families set up roadside villages, turning their alligator hunting skills into a show that visitors pay to see. By the early 1970s, Half the Everglades are gone, replaced by an agricultural Eden with land to grow fruit and vegetables and acreage for development and grazing. People saved up money for photos mm -hmm. and they would wait for the traveling photographer to come to mm -hmm. town. Is this your dad? No, it's my dad. What'd you say? <laughs> This is my great-grandfather, his Je Jeff Thomas, Jefferson Davis Thomas, him cooking and preparing swamp cabbage somewhere in South Florida. This one was taken, two taken in 2011, and that's me right there. And in the middle is Jefferson Davis's oldest son, and his name was Dylan Thomas. He was a cowboy. I mean, he was a real, honest to God cowboy like you know you would have seen in the movies he's a small guy and that's him cutting up a swamp cabbage one of the final times I went out with him this is my grandfather's family he's on the end down here well, that's the way it was back in the old days it's not like that now this looks like old cattle land to me I mean it wasn't nothing but cattle everywhere in the state of Florida we had more cattle here than they did in Texas that was me, I was about five years old, riding, well, this is my uncle's ranch. And this is me and my son on the ranch where we live now. He's just a whole lot like me, and we both worked cattle, you know, on horses, and did a lot of the same things. For many, many years, the basic commerce for Florida was cattle, way over tourism, and way over citrus. It was all working on the land, you know, taking care of livestock and fruit trees. Yeah, they had two rules, you work and you go to church. That was it. Immokalee is the agricultural heart of Florida, with a climate well-suited for year-round growing and grazing. On a ranch outside town, we meet up with Clint Rollerson, a cowboy who works the same land that his family has for three generations. This ranch has a lot of history for me and my family. My grandfather worked here in 1930. My father was born right here. Your dad yep, was my, born right my here. Yep, my dad was born 100 feet from where we're sitting. And I get, to, I get to ride a horse on the same ground that my grandfather rode almost 90 years ago. That's pretty important to me. So your family goes back in Florida ranching for three generations. What photograph actually talks about that the most in, in, on this table here? There's actually two. Uh, this picture is of my great-grandmother Rollerson. This is in Polk County uh -huh. uh, in the early 1900s. Mm. And this is with her children. And after this picture, they scattered around the state. Some stayed in the cattle business. And this is my grandfather and my grandmother on their wedding day on November 15th, 1930. Wow. And it was right here near Immokalee. He was the first rancher in this Southwest Florida. In his business, he was known as one of the best. The Rallisons chose a hard life, living in remote cow camps or in Spartan bunkhouses like this one, preserved by the museum at Roberts Ranch. Wow. So my grandfather stayed here sometime in the 1930s, 40s. Mm -hmm. So he had a bunk mate, there were yeah. several people. There might even been another bed in here, huh? It may have been. They were away from their family. So their families like lived somewhere else and then they yeah. were just... Hard working people. How did the legacy pass down from him to you? Just being a cowboy is something you grow up wanting to do if you're around it. It's in your blood. Around the nation, it's not looked at as a big ranching community, but we're a cowboy state. It's not all about Mickey Mouse and the beaches for Florida. We take a lot of pride in what we do. There used to be a lot more cattle from Immokalee South than there is now. 
But between development, um, government buying up lands, we're, we're losing ranch lands all the time. And I see a picture of a beautiful woman there with you. Yes, this is me and my wife. How long have you guys been married? 31 years. Wow. You and your wife, you come from different lineages? No, totally different. Mine goes back to Scotland. She's Mexican. We have a pretty mixed family, mm -hmm. you know. Is this kind of a normal family for Immokalee? Yes, it's a common thing. Immokalee's probably 3%, 4% Caucasian these days. So I'm looking at these photographs of uh, these kids on the ranch. Do you think your grandkids are gonna follow your tradition? They already like the ranch. They already like to be horseback and do things with me. It's pretty important to all of us. So when you look at these images, which are, you know, pretty classic, you know, images, yeah. What comes to mind? What comes to mind? Oh, I get proud. <laughs> I do. Um, damn it. Uh, to be able to take them with me in the daytime and show them the, the life that I love and the, the lifestyle that has built our family, um, there's just, there's really no words. It's so important. They're fantastic and they love it and they want to be out there. And I remember those days. I think that's one of the biggest things is I remember it. And you just, you can't stop passing it down. I came from a long line of cowboys, they say. My granddad came from Bassinger Way. Now he watches me do this job I love from somewhere up in heaven above. And it's for this reason I sit my horse with such pride because it's for the men before me that I write. I don't consider what I write really poems. They're more stories. They just happen to rhyme. It's inspired by all the people I grew up watching. I just want people to kind of get a window into this lifestyle and realize that we are still here. We're fading a little bit, but we're hanging in there. <laughs> No, you I think it's important to the grandkids. Uh, all, my, all my kids are important to me. From the sons, daughters, and grandkids, and great-grandkids, they're all very important to me. This is a chiba, otherwise known as a goat or a high lift. And this signifies the hard work that my dad did. He worked seven days a week, and um, we never needed anything. My mom never had to work, raised eight kids, and that meant the world to have such a hardworking man who came from nothing and provided for us through picking oranges. Immokalee has long been one of the poorest places in the nation. These images shock the country in Edward R. Murrow's legendary 1960 documentary, Harvest of Shame. They are the migrants, the underprotected, the undereducated. Only on name they are not slaves, but in a way they are treated, they are with the slaves. The Harvest of Shame. The best hope for the future of the migrants lies in the education of their children. But for the children of migrants, education is not easy to come by. And there is no case upon the record of the child of a migrant laborer ever receiving a college diploma. Ever receiving a college diploma. Our family is originally from Zacatecas, Mexico. We migrated and to Immokalee when I was five. Um, and we've been living here since. Our father is uh, the pillar of our family. His hard work ethic is what represents us as a family. We chose this picture because this is where it all started. My mom and dad getting married. After this, they had us and the story continues. I see us, um, I see our family background, uh, my brothers, my sisters. 
So these are a little bit of our origin when we made it to the United States. This is the first picture where my dad and my oldest brother, Felipe, decided that they wouldn't be working for anybody else. They will be working for themselves, and this is where their company started, uh, which was the beginning of a lot of great things for us. We worked the fields as a big family. We do a lot of the crops. We used to do tomatoes and a little bit of everything. Once we worked for our own family, we were able to actually come back to school on time because my parents felt education was the only way. So instead of you know following their footsteps, we needed to create our own. I'm the first one to go to college. I went to the University of Florida, Gator fan. We always challenged one another. Um, he graduated number five in his high four, four in his high, <laughs> high school class. I was number five, so I was down by one. <laughs> Zalika Cantero not only earned a college degree, she became a teacher and is now the principal of an elementary school. 90% of her students have parents who are farm workers. Zalika uses her own photographs and story to inspire her students. 